Hello everyone. Welcome back. So in the last lecture, uh, I introduced the basic ideas of optical gain and how a laser cavity is constructed and how lasing occurs, right? We discussed the fundamental aspects of it. Now, in this lecture, I want to move a little bit ahead and then I want to discuss about nanoscale lasing. So I think I have shown this particular slide already in my introduction video to the course. I said that if you have a, uh, there is a big mismatch between the size of the electrical components or electrical uh, uh, transistors and the optical devices like a laser, a modulator and so on. So I showed this picture and said that so this is the IC with lots of transistors and this is just a single laser, a modulator, a few modulators and detectors, right? So, I, and I also said that, okay, there is this uh, huge opportunity for disruptive research in integrating these optoelectronic devices. And I showed you, uh, this is an example from Intel, this is from Mar Marvel. So, a lot of interesting work that's being done, okay. And this is actually very recent work. So, uh, now I want to ask a question. Why should we miniaturize a laser? It might seem very uh, natural given that you know we have seen so much of benefits when we miniaturize the electronic devices, namely the MOSFETs. There was a lot of improvement in terms of uh, the price, the performance and so on. So we should do the same thing with uh, optical devices. Yeah, that's one argument. But I just want to give you a more uh, detailed argument. So right now we know that uh, uh, no, the communication, long distance communication is all with an optical fiber. In fact, if you look at any supercomputer, the connections between the various racks in a supercomputer is already with a fiber. So typically what they would do is, you know, have a laser driver, uh, basically a chip or a board, which essentially has these uh, pixels integrated on it. And then you modulate these lasers depending on how much information you, you know, uh, uh, what information you want to transmit. And all of that is transmitted over an optical fiber and you can have a receiver circuit on the other end, which is the opposite. So this is already happening. Now, if you want to miniaturize that and actually bring it on the chip, a possible uh, approach could be to integrate them on the chip. Okay, so you'll have to uh, pixels. I'll introduce what is a pixel, but in a moment. But these are reasonably large devices. Now, so I have to miniaturize my laser and also the detectors, and then you'll also have some things like waveguide on a chip and so on. Right. The important, I think, driving factor in this regard is the energy. Okay. Always when we miniaturize uh, the electronic devices, we have seen that the amount of power consumption reduces or at least reasonably const uh, made it remains the same while the number of operations that we can do increases. Okay, So right now, uh, a typical amount of energy that is spent in performing a floating bit operation is a uh, floating point operation is about 0.01 to 0 0.05 picojoules per bit. So it's a small amount of energy that is required to actually perform the operation, the logic. But if you look at the energy that is required to transport the data, because a computing device actually just performs a computation, but it has to interact with the external world. So if you're trying to transport this data, it turns out that the amount of energy required to transport this information or a bit is actually much, much larger, up to almost 200 times larger than the energy required to perform the computation itself. So in this case, some number, I've, I've taken this data from the, this presentation by Benner at uh, one of these conferences. You can look at this reference, you'll find it. So the amount of energy is 200 times larger if you're trying to transmit the information on a card, maybe a few inches, okay? But the moment you want to transport the data over large distances, like between, you know, uh, maybe, you know, meter scale, the amount of energy required would be even more larger, like almost like 2000 X larger. So this is a large amount of energy and we would like to minimize that so, so that we can transmit information efficiently. Why would we want to do that? Well, it turns out that now, I think in 2022, uh, one of the first demonstration of an exascale computer, computer was done. So essentially it can perform 10 power 18 operations per second. So there are problems like weather modeling and uh, you know mapping the brain and so on, so which require huge computational resources and you have computers which are doing that. So when you have such a large amount of computational capacity, you also have to bring in information to the computer on that scale. So there's a, a tremendous amount of requirement to transport this data. 
and that itself requires huge huge budgets you know somewhere i have seen a number uh, i don't remember where exactly but you know up to tens of megawatts of power is required just to transport the data so it's a significant thing so and if you are able to reduce the amount of energy required for transport that's a that's a big addition you know or it's an improvement in technology so what prevents us from reducing the amount required for transmitting the data one of the challenges in that regard is that the traditional lasers you know i showed you one laser in the last uh, lecture wherein i said that there is this gain medium a double heterostructure and then the facets are cleaved right that 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 is called as an edge emitting laser because it emits from the side and that's a standard laser in the past uh, in the 1960s it was invented so now if you look at that laser the the threshold for lasing is typically in the order of milliwatts so the threshold is reasonably high all right and if you look at that sort of a threshold and if you look at let's say you want to transmit 10 gigabits per second data rate you will it will roughly translate to about picojoules per bit so since the laser threshold is high there is nothing you can do about it you have to expend that much of energy to even just generate and transmit the data right there's nothing you, even if you have a perfect interconnect you would still have to expend that much of energy because just the threshold is high all right so but is it really required to spend that much of energy in actually you know uh, uh, going beyond the threshold of a laser well it turns out that if you look at a photo detector it can actually detect pulses with as low energy as you know 0.2 femtojoules so it's a very very small amount of energy that is required to actually detect pulses if you have even a ther- you know thermal noise limited photo detector but because the laser has a very high threshold we are forced to transmit you know energy at that range and we would like to minimize that so what stops us actually from reducing the threshold the reason threshold is high is that the lasers are substantially large tens of micro i said tens to hundreds of micron size when you have a large area device we will have to create population over all of that region you know much larger active region and so we have to expend that much of energy that's one reason why the threshold is large and uh, so the immediate question will be can we shrink the size of the laser so that we actually we don't have to you know pump a large volume we pump a small region of space and that should provide us lasing if it's possible right so that's a natural question to ask and that is what i'm uh, illustrating here schematically so think of you know the original uh, laser was this you know uh, you know you had this uh, double heterostructure with two edges can i make it smaller can i even do away with the mirrors and actually confine my electromagnetic energy in a nano disk like this we have seen when we studied the mirror resonances we saw that just a semiconductor disk itself can confine large um, i mean can confine energy and the q factor can be reasonably large so if you have a large disk typically on the sky, uh, sizes of you know i would call this as maybe micro disk it's been shown that you can have very good confinement of electromagnetic electromagnetic energy in that and it can actually exhibit lasing but the moment you try to go to nano scale like you know for example if you went to nano antennas semiconductor nano antennas i mentioned when we did the me calculation me theory calculations of it so if you have a nano antenna there's a problem the reason is we have understood the fundamental diffraction limit of light right so if you have a particular medium of refractive index n and that the size of the antenna is smaller than that we automatically saw that the wave is going to leak out into the surrounding environment and that is what is schematically shown here so if the wave is leaking out that means the cavity is not really that good okay so how can we miniaturize these devices okay so this is an active area of research and a lot of work has been done over the last uh, uh, you know 20 years i would say 20 to 30 years so i would just try to give you a snapshot of it okay so with our understanding now you you know why it's a problem to miniaturize this antennas right and now so i'll give you a snapshot so that you appreciate the research that's it okay my goal is not really to explain each and every aspect of it that would really be an intensive course in itself just the design of the nano lasers so uh, i will not go into that i'll just give you a snapshot all right so this is a very quick overview uh, of how the nano scale lasers evolved over the last you know 30 to 40 years okay so the original devices that were initially fabricated was you know this edge emitting lasers so you had the double heterostructure and that from the side you have the emission so the the facet here on the side this and this acts as a mirror and light goes back and forth between that and then you have emission so these edge emitting devices were 
actually demonstrated way back in 1960s and they work very well one of the important figure of merits in this case is the volume of the device divided by the wavelength whole cube so the lambda cube is roughly how much the wavelength is right so how much can you confine you know how much smaller than the light is the uh, you know, volume of the laser so if you look at these edge emitting devices the eel means edge emitting lasers this is when you have this edge emitting lasers you see that they perform reasonably well but their volume is large so this is the range over which you can have uh, lasing okay these are the traditional cavities and quickly after that you know in about a decade or so by 1978 a new type of design was implemented that is called as a vixel so this is basically a vixel means vertical cavity surface emitting laser so if you look at the traditional laser the cavity actually is formed by the mirrors on the edges here and then there is there has to be a certain volume for the lasing to happen so that was not very efficient and the size was large so scientists invented the idea of a vertical cavity so what they did was they would put a mirror in the bottom and the top and then they gain medium in between so it's also interesting how this you know mirrors are constructed these are actually what are called as uh, distributed bragg mirrors dbrs uh, you know using photonic crystal ideas we can actually design these structures so it's simply alternating layers of a different dielectric constants and so that at a particular point we saw that there's a peak reflection so you put two different uh, distributed uh, bragg reflectors that way and in between that you put a gain medium here schematically shown by this here and then you have a lasing cavity and now instead of light emitting out uh, you know from the sideways which is difficult to couple light is emitted on the top and now this device size can be much smaller than the traditional laser so the light is being emitted outward like this and if you compare to the original edge emitting lasers the vertical cavity lasers are actually much smaller in about an order of magnitude or so smaller okay so this is the vexel that was done in 1978 so already four decades back very old technology but now the idea is can we miniaturize this further so one of the landmarks in that direction is a micro disc laser which was demonstrated in the early 1990s so instead of it this cav sort of a cavity take a simple disk okay and in this form it is in this case this is actually uh, supported by a small pyramid bottom below so there is a disk which is holding on to uh, sitting on top of a pyramid and so when you have such a disk which is a you know gain medium with some uh, the diameter of the disk would be something like 5 to 10 microns of that scale so you have uh, what are known as uh, whispering gallery modes basically the light keeps going around in circles in that micro disk so this is a micro disk laser micro disk laser and you know in that light keeps traveling in you know uh, circles so it essentially it constructively interferes at a interferes at a particular wavelength and you have lasing so when you come to this you see that with a micro disk the the size of the laser has dramatically reduced compared to the vixel so this is one of the, one of the key uh, factors kind of another key achievements in 90s early 90s and later on you know the even the ideas of photonic crystals you know we talked about the photonic crystals wherein you have this arrays of holes exhibiting photonic band gaps so if you have such a structure exhibiting a photonic band gap so i can create a small region of space which is having a gain medium and all around it i make it a photonic band gap so in that case light cannot escape anywhere else and it is forced to be confined to a small volume and that using that it is shown that you can actually have lasing okay one of the uh, problems here is that even though the gain area is very small the surrounding cavity turns out to be in the range of you know tens of microns so uh, overall still the 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 size of the laser is of the same similar scale as the micro disc laser so these are all uh, this is another achievement that happened around the turn of the century after that you know in the early 2000s there was a lot of effort try to actually grow nano wires uh and nano wires means just a disk of uh, maybe you know few microns less than a micron or so and then you you actually grow a vertical nano wire and in that the cavity is formed so you can have again edge emitting devices in nano wires and you can have lasing from them as well so if you notice all three of these structures here both the the micro disk laser the photonic crystal cavity laser and the nano wire laser the sizes are relatively same so for about almost i would say three decades two decades if the micro disk is early 90s so till about i think late 2000s at least two decades 
there was not much of progress in miniaturizing the laser. The reason for that was all of these are essentially constructed out of what we call as dielectric materials. And we know that if you have a dielectric material, you can't miniaturize below a certain point, right? Below, below a certain size, if you try to miniaturize the dielectric structure, the light is not confined very well. So they are limited by the diffraction limit. And to overcome that, one of the landmark achievements was uh, actually demonstration of what is known as a plasmonic laser or a spacer. The I, this was done in the year 2009, so just over 10 years back. So the basic idea for a, a spacer was actually proposed by Mark Stockman and Bergman in 2003, I believe. And uh, later on in 2009, a group of people, you know, a group of uh, various research groups actually, one from Purdue, one from, I think, uh, Berkeley and another from I, I'm not sure, I forgot where it is but then three different groups in the almost the same year they demonstrated uh, lasing uh, which actually uh, the ca where the cavity is actually sub diffraction limit uh, below the diffraction limit so in the case of a uh, spacer or a plasmonic laser so these arrows represent you know where the antenna where the volumes of the devices that were de demonstrated but in principle we already know that if you have a plasmonic tunnel structure we can actually confine light much below the diffraction limit Right, we we know that the 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 k vector for the SPP surface plasmon for polariton or even surface plasmon is much much greater than the the wave vector for a free space. So because of that, you can actually confine light in much smaller dimensions. And in principle, it looks possible that if you have a plasmonic laser, you can actually go to even smaller dimensions. Okay, and if you have a small much smaller confinement of uh, energy, definitely your uh, lasing would be better. Right, the lasing threshold will be lower. So this was the overall picture how uh, evolution happened. Evolution of the lasing uh, lasers happened right from 1960s to 2009. So and uh, this is just the uh, to give you a flavor of what this was. You know the plasmonic nano lasers. So as I said, there was one group uh, uh, led by uh, Professor Noginov in Norfolk and Professor Shalai at Purdue and a few others. So wherein they have taken a gold particle, nano particle, and then so. Uh, coated that with a silica shell and the silica shell actually was embedded with a dye so the dye essentially acted like a gain medium and the the gold core acted like the you know source of surface plasmons and when you have such a such a core shell nanostructure this is what we call as core shell nanostructure they saw that the lasing uh, you, they saw that the wavelength of the, the emitted light actually is very narrow, indicating that there is lasing. And immediately after that, uh, just the same around this next issue of the Nature Journal here, the another group by Shang Zhang, uh, uh, another group led by Shang Zhang from Berkeley, they demonstrated uh, a lasing phenomena using a nanowire. So in this case, what they did was they took a metal, coated with a dielectric, and put a nanowire on top. The nanowire is a semiconductor. You pump it; it ex it creates the gain. And then at the interface between, in, in the gap between the nanowire and the metal, there's a gap plasmon mode which is excited. And that actually, uh, you, the gain amplifies the gap plasmon mode. And you have lasing from this tiny region in between the separation of uh, the, the, the cad cadmium sulfide nanowire and the metal in the bottom. So the thickness of the dielectric, you know, the MGF2, magnesium fluoride film here, uh, determines how well the mode is confined and they showed that if you have such a structure you can actually have lasing and from a very very low volume okay one important uh, feature that i think we should appreciate i think so far all the demonstrations of nano lasers uh, it's been uh, they have been you know uh, it's all of them nearly all of them have confinement of electromagnetic energy in only one of the dimensions really three dimensional confinement this is one example where there is three dimensional confinement but still this is a you know uh, nanoparticles embedded in a matrix so if you have a structure like this here there's a confinement in the vertical direction but along the nanowire it's large so we still don't have a very good laser where all the three dimensions you know in all the three dimensions you can find the electromagnetic energy and that would be an interesting thing that has to be done okay so so this is one particular case and uh, after this, again, you know, there is a whole uh, zoo of demonstrations, I would say, various structures that people have proposed, uh, starting from these initial demonstrations, uh, where people have tried various configurations to demonstrate nanoscale lasing. So on the top, you have this, you know, old uh, microdisc and nanowire. Uh, and later on, this was followed by uh, 
metal dielectric uh, structures where they combine the metal structure to provide the confinement and the dielectric to provide the gain. So a whole range of uh, de lasers were demonstrated. And if you want to know the details, you can go and look at this particular review, which summarizes all of it, where they are taken from, some of the key highlights. And uh, one of the key, I think I like this uh, demonstration a lot, so I, uh, I am emphasizing this here. So this is uh, uh, from Arizona State, I believe. So wherein they have taken the semiconductor, and you see now we, are, uh, we, are, we understand what this is, right? We have a, heterostru we have a heterostructure. So you have uh, uh, phosphide substrate, and then there is different doping, uh, different layers that are grown on top of it. And then here is my uh, gain medium. Sorry, uh, the gain medium should be this. Oh no, N type. N type. So the gain medium, I think, should be here in between. So wherein, you know, the size of this structure is, you know, 500 nanometers on the right. So you see that. So it's this, it's larger than the wavelength of light, but the interesting thing is here it's electrically driven. So you have a bottom contact, so the electrons are holes, you know, the holes are injected from here, and the electrons are injected from the top contact here, and then they recombine in this region and then emit light. So this is an electrically driven laser. The previous two demonstrations here, these are actually optically pumped. Optically pumped are nice, but uh, eventually if you want to integrate it in terms of technology, you would want to have electrically pumped uh, laser. So even though this is not sub-wavelength, I like it because it's one of the first demonstrations of uh, electrically pumped uh, lasing from metal dielectric structures. This was, I think, done in 2007. So when you increase the current that is applied to this, you see that initially at low currents, below the threshold, you have a broad emission. That's what is shown here. The blue is probably, low, uh, it's definitely low current uh, below the threshold. And as you increase the amount of current that is applied, you see that there is a sharp peak that comes out. And this sharp peak is what is known as uh, a lasing peak. So generally, when you have uh, below the threshold, you have only spontaneous emission, amplified spontaneous emission. So there's a broad emission over a range of wavelengths where you can have gain. But when you cross the threshold, one particular mode becomes dominant and all the electromagnetic energy is actually emitted into that particular mode. And the signature, the, the, the change of the emission width, FWHM, the full width half maximum of the emission from a broad uh, emission into a narrow one is one of the signatures of lasing. Okay. And it turns out that, of course, even just what is lasing and what is a threshold of a laser itself is quite uh, uh, a matter of debate. So initially, people would demonstrate this sort of a you know peak, which is narrow. Uh, that was accepted initially, but then over time, people realized that that is not itself enough. We have to look at other properties of laser. And I'll just show you one more in the next lecture. But uh, yeah, so this is the, the way the field has evolved over time. And lastly, this was the metal dielectric structures. But there's also an increased emphasis on trying to find alternative cavity structures to actually get lasing. Okay. So I said that dielectric structures are, I mean, they cannot be, con I mean, they cannot be, they cannot confine energy smaller than the wavelength. But can we have alternative structures which can actually provide low threshold lasing? So there's a, there's a lot of work that is going on in what we can call as arrays of nanoparticles. All right. So, so this is a brief overview of uh, nanoscale uh, lasers. Uh, mind you, I know I just only talked about the lasers, but in effect, you actually need other devices like the modulators and you know the detectors and so on also have to be miniaturized. Uh, and all of that is an intense area of research across the world. And there's a lot of excitement around this. But in this course, I think we will not really have the time to cover that. So I'll stop here for now. And I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you very much.